Well, I said last Sunday that um, I would reveal the contents of the can. Now, if uh, you have been here for any length of time and have come through a class that I teach called Let's Get Acquainted, one of the things I do is have this can illustration. And everyone in the course of uh, the class gets one opportunity to guess what's in this can. This is my sixth can of 35 years teaching this class. Now, I'm gonna give each section one chance to get one last guess, okay, here, but I'm gonna give you a clue, all right, because this is what it's been in the past. It's not sliced beets, that was the first one. It's not um, split pea soup. It's not artichoke hearts. It's not clam sauce. And it's not yams, okay? So those are the five previous ones. So, so one, one, one last guess from this section over here. Oh, just guess. What? Beets, no. Right here, Tom. Sauerkraut, no. Over here. What kind of soup? No. Russ. Wait, cream of mushroom soup? No. <laughs> okay, here you go. You ready? <laughs> Seven year winning streak. <laughs> now, some have gotten a little close as I said fruit, but it wasn't papaya, so I always had to be at least the, the name of the item in the can. Now, why, why, why have I used this illustration? I've used this illustration simply to illustrate the value of a label. When you don't have a label on something, you don't know, you know what's in the can. And I use this uh, illustration when I, when I teach uh, our Baptist distinctives. Now, I said this last week, you know, we, we don't beat the Baptist drum all the time. We don't think that Baptists are the only people that, you know, are going to heaven or any, anything like that. But, but we do have a label. And, and the label Baptist simply helps identify what's in the can. It helps identify what a church is about. And so this is our label, and in that label, if you'd use an acrostic with uh, reference to uh, the word Baptist, you see our first uh, distinction is biblical authority. This is where we get our marching orders. This is where we get our purpose. This is where uh, we arrive at why we do uh, what we do. It comes solely from the Bible. Uh, that's, that's a very important uh, distinction to make because there are some uh, religious groups that they say, oh yes, we believe the Bible, but we also believe in tradition. We also believe in, in, in what uh, other church writers have, have written that can supersede what the Bible says or ritual or things along those lines. We get our distinction solely from the Bible. And, and one of those distinctions, as you can see there, is saved, baptized church membership. And so that's why we have um, a baptism service that we're having here this morning uh, because of the distinctives that are taught uh, in the scripture. And what we want to do this morning is simply just walk you through uh, hopefully a helpful understanding of, of the significance of baptism so that as you view uh, the seven testimonies uh, this morning, uh, you can do so with, with understanding behind it. And so what we wanna look at and focus on is this simple truth this morning, is, is that baptism is the public step of faith that an individual takes having trusted in Jesus Christ as their savior from sin, having experienced a brand new life in him, and then step forward in faith saying, I am now a devoted follower of Jesus. Now, for some of you who might be new, and I've, I've shared this illustration before, 
you know, uh, baptism, it, like maybe this might be something that you've never witnessed before uh, as well. And um, years ago, you know, nothing really magical or anything happens uh, with, uh, with a service, but some people can be really nervous when it comes to getting baptized. And this was the only time we had an issue was several years ago, you know, Mike Stravella, he's watching online this morning from uh, Florida, they're down there right now, but Mike was as nervous as a, a cat in a hot tin roof uh, when it came to him getting baptized. And, and lo and behold, wouldn't you know it, you know, I baptized him, and, and when he came up, this is what happened. <laughs> Other than that, we've had nine issues. That was a terrible day. People are screaming, running out of the <laughs> church, whatever, and, and after a day or so, he turned back to normal. But that's the only time we had an issue. So folks, don't worry, you know, uh, uh, that are getting baptized today. Just joking. This is where we get our marching orders. This is why we do what we do that is reflected in this morning from Acts chapter 2, because Acts chapter 2 and verse 41 really sets forth the pattern for uh, what a local church is to be about. And you can see there uh, where it says in Acts chapter 2, 41, after Peter had preached the very first message in what's called the church age, um, the people there realized their guilt, realized what they had done in rejecting Christ, and heard the good news of the gospel of what he alone could do for them. And it says this, and those who gladly received his word, that literally means to, to accept with satisfaction. Uh, there's nothing like the satisfaction of understanding the gospel, understanding its personal message for you. And to accept that truth and to experience its life-changing result. And so that is when they believed. And it says, those who gladly received his word, then next we see they were baptized. And we'll talk about that in a moment. And then at that day, then after that, 3, 000, about 3,000 souls were added to them. And so we see the New Testament pattern is to believe and then to be baptized and then to belong to what God is doing in the building up of his church. And so baptism is central to our pattern that we see taught here in the scriptures. And so what I want to look at here this morning, just briefly, are three reasons why we go public in baptism. Why do we do this? Why do we have this public nature of a service? Why can't we just do it out in public, in private someplace, and get it done there? Well, well here's why uh, we see that. First of all, we see it's a matter of obedience. It's a matter of obedience. See, baptism is a direct ask of Jesus to go public for him. That's what it is. We see in Matthew chapter 10 where he said, everyone who acknowledges me publicly here on earth, I will also acknowledge before my Father in heaven. But everyone who denies me here on earth, I will also deny before my Father in heaven. It's a public ask for, by Jesus. See, Jesus asks everyone who comes to him to go public for him. And baptism is the way Jesus asked us to own our relationship with him before others. He said in Matthew chapter 28, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. See, baptism is when in obedience we stand up and are counted. It's saying, I'm not ashamed of Christ. I'm not saying I have my act together, that I've arrived, or that I'm better than anybody else, but I have moved from one camp to the other, and I've come to Jesus as my forgiver and as my leader. We've said this many times here that one of our goals is to minimize the number of people who someday are going to have to stand before God Almighty and confess that they spent their life in the camp of the uncommitted. And we see that this is the step of obedience that Jesus calls us to. It's when you declare to your community, this is who I am, this is who I follow, and this is what I believe. 
And what's interesting that in terms of, of New Testament Christianity, the first followers of Jesus in the New Testament got this loud and clear. There's not one deviation in the New Testament from this pattern of people having trusted in Christ, following him in obedience to being baptized. It would have been unthinkable and a direct act, act of disobedience uh, about the Savior to whom they believed in and wanted to follow because it really was a direct and specific ask of Jesus. And so it's a step of obedience. Secondly, here we see this reason why we go public in baptism is because it's a matter of testimony. It's a matter of testimony. It's a, it's a testimony to reflect what has happened to you spiritually when you trusted in Jesus. It's an illustration. When you go down into the waters of baptism, it reflects how you have died to sin. When you are buried uh, going under the water, reflecting Christ's death. And then in light of that, when you come up out of the water, it reflects his resurrection and the new life that you have received having trusted in Jesus. Nothing salvific happens when we baptize here, uh, when, when we do this. It's just a testimony of what has already taken place. It's a testimony how Jesus has washed you from your sins and that now you belong to him. It doesn't save you, but it testifies to the fact that now you are saved. It's, it's just like, you know, my wedding ring that says, I belong to Claudia Shirk. That's what it says. It's a testimony of that. It's, you know, the bills aren't playing today, but when the bills are playing, it's interesting, you know, half of the congregation is dressed out in bills garb. Why? Because you're unashamed followers of the Buffalo Bills. They're your team. You're identifying with them. It, it shows what side you're on. And that's the testimony of baptism. And then the third reason why we go public in uh, baptism is because it's a matter of testing. It's a matter of testing. Baptism is the test to see whether or not your relationship to Jesus has teeth. It's a test to see if you are willing to be obedient and willing to go public for him and testify that you are an unashamed follower of Christ. It's a test right at the beginning of our professed relationship to him to see if we're serious about our commitment or not. And so the question simply as we orient ourselves to our time together is so who should be uh, baptized? Well, what we see is simply this. Everyone who has entered a relationship with Jesus Christ. And we see in Acts later on in that book, chapter 22. And now what are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. Be clean from your sins as you call on his name. See, baptism is a badge of belonging. It's marking God's people off from the world and marks a decisive break from your pre-Christian life. It's a testimony of responsiveness and desire to be a part of the camp of the committed. And I praise God for what we have seen through the years here of a multiplicity of people whom God has sovereignly and wonderfully reached down into their life story and has totally changed the trajectory of their eternity in helping them to see what he did for them in giving his life so that they might have all their sins forgiven and have a home in heaven and purpose in their life until that day that God calls them home. And so we see back to the can. Christ followers, don't leave others guessing who they're about. And we praise God this morning for the seven individuals that, that God has wonderfully worked in their lives to bring them to this point of, of obedience and testimony in their desire to be a devoted follower of Jesus. 
I'm going to have a word of prayer, and then I'll give a few instructions, and then we'll continue on here. Let's pray. Father, just thank you for this time now that uh, we're privileged to witness, and we pray for your sovereign work in our midst and your blessing as uh, we hear the stories of what you have done and are doing in lives. And so we pray for your blessing to that end in Christ's name. Amen. All right, well, the worship team is going to come at uh, this time and uh, lead us in a song. And uh, the children from Kids Church are going to be coming in to, to witness as, a, as well. And those of us who are going to be being baptized and such are going to be doing so. So uh, at this time, the worship team will lead us in a song. So, Kayla? Good morning. Uh, we're going to start with the song, Jesus, Thank You, if you would stand and sing with us. The mystery of the cross I cannot comprehend The agonies of Calvary You, the perfect Holy One, crushed your soul. Drank the bitter cup reserved for me. Your blood has washed away my sin. Jesus, thank you. The Father's wrath completely satisfied. Jesus, thank you. Once your enemy, now seated at your table, Jesus led you. By a perfect sacrifice, I then brought me. Glorious grace, your 
It's really exciting to see uh, the breadth of ages that we have represented in light of God at work in all of uh, the generations of our church. And I'm just really excited about the first individual coming. One of my best friends, Cassandra Kessler. Why don't you come on down here, Cassandra? Cassandra and I have been best friends since she was a little girl, and it's just been exciting to see what God has done in her life and her desire to be a follower of Jesus. So Cassandra, go ahead and read your testimony. Hi, good morning. Hi, my name is Cassandra Faith Kessler. I grew up going to church. My mom and dad are family, and Pastor Shirk, Pastor Zach, and Pastor Jeff talk about what God has done for us. They are talking about the grace not giving up when Jesus carried the cross for our sin. I listen to the church, the title videos and CDs a lot, and they talk about Jesus born in a manger and he died for my sins. I asked to Jesus to be my savior and I will to be in heaven with him. Uh, Sunday. Uh, now I watch the uh, videos that sing about Jesus and get can give love for him. All right. Thank you, Cassandra. Here. Okay, Cassandra. Well, I am just so excited about what God has done in your life and for just the blessing of you being such a special friend to me and many, many of our church family. And so upon profession of your faith in Christ as your Savior, yeah. it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. All right. Amen. Love you, Dad! You had to. I know. Here we go. There we go. Okay. She always tells me I'm handsome. <laughs> and I say I know. <laughs> it's exciting also to see what God is doing in the Kessler family at large. And Eric comes at this time uh, to share of his desire to follow the Lord in believer's baptism. Eric? Hello. As you have probably heard by this point, my name is Eric Kessler. Um, unsurprisingly, I also grew up in a Christian home. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, I was always taught all the right things to say and do, but when I was a little kid, three or four, I said the line, prayed the believer's prayer. I went on life, life, because like nothing was different, because nothing was. I was, I did not understand at all what I was talking about. Uh, <laughs> Then I got a little older, went to uh, Lamoka camp, and chapel really struck me that day because I knew I didn't believe anything up until this point. After that, I talked to the ca camp counselor, and this time I did know what I meant. Mm -hmm. uh, since then, I... <laughs> have not been a perfect Christian. I have made a fair number of dumb decisions. Um, I've lost my way more than once, but God has always called me back. Uh, I still hadn't done a believer's baptism in all that time. Always believed I needed to, but I never made it a priority, and that's what I'm changing today. Uh, my life verse is Romans 6, 1 through 2. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning that grace may abound? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Hmm. I think what that verse means to me is that I lived a lot of my life knowing that I was forgiven and made bad choices knowing I would be forgiven, completely missing the point of what I what being a Christian means and that's not okay and that verse helps remind me of that 
Yeah, that, that's all I got. Amen. Amen. Well, Eric, I just praise God. Likewise, it's been a blessing to see you grow up in our church from a little boy now to a young man and to, to really see you coming full cycle and owning your walk with Christ. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to really do in and through you in the days ahead as, as this day is truly a stake in the ground day for you. And so I praise God for that. And so upon profession of your faith, and Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin. It's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lord, sir. Great job. All right. After... Eric, we have Ashley Stanley. Ashley? There we go. It's been exciting just to get to know Ashley and to see what God has done in her life. So this time she's going to share her story. Hi, good morning. My name is Ashley Stanley. I grew up, in a, I grew up Catholic. I was baptized as a baby and I made my first communion in third grade. Although I was baptized as a baby, I did not understand what it meant, and I did not remember it happening. I attended Sunday school most Sundays until fifth grade. My sister and I always felt that going to Sunday school was a chore and dreaded going. We stopped going to Sunday school, and we got very involved with extra activities at school. I was introduced to death at a very young age. I lost most of my family in an accident. Because of this, a lot of my family, a lot of people who were supposed to be leadership roles in my life were not there. Fortunately, I had my mother who raised me wonderfully. When I was two, God gave my mom, my sister, and me the best gift, my stepfather. He has filled all the leadership roles I needed as a young girl. It's okay. He and my mom have taught and guided me into making good decisions. But as a sinner, I did not always make the best decisions. I was a more challenging child of my sister and me when we were in middle and high school. I was considered a troublemaker and a mean girl. This was because I did not understand the importance of being Christ-like. It wasn't until I started dating Soren in my freshman year of college that I realized that my actions were inappropriate. When COVID hit, I was a senior in high school. Since then, I have struggled with anxiety. This past year was probably the worst it has ever been. At college, I had roommates who lived a different lifestyle than me, which caused my anxiety to worsen. In March, I decided to seek counseling at Grace Baptist Church. Through counseling, Gail Waldron and Joan Dialba explained to me that I was born a sinner. Since I'm a sinner, the penalty for sin is death, apart from God. Gail also explained to me that Jesus took the punishment for my sins by dying on the cross and rising again. On March 25th, I accepted Jesus into my heart. At that moment, I put my faith in God. I had been, have been attending Grace every Sunday for the past two years. Before I was saved, I would come to church and listen and sometimes apply it to my life. I also struggled with turning to prayer before anything else. Now that I am saved, I take notes during services to use throughout the week. I also pray throughout the day, do daily devotions, and make sure my conversations please God. The anxiety that I used to experience disappears when I start my day studying verses such as Philippians 4, 6. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Amen. Amen. Well, Ashley, I'm just excited about what God has done. You know, the transformation from a mean girl <laughs> to, to a meaningful life. And we just praise God for that and his very real evidence of grace in your life. And so upon profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior from sin, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. All right, and next we have Soren Calderon. Yes, sir. It's just been a blessing to have the Calderon family here and again to watch these uh, children grow up from being little to now a young man. And uh, Soren, I'm just excited about what God has done. So share your story. Hi, my name is Soren Calderon. I grew up in a Christian home all my life. 
my family and I started attending Grace Baptist Church at around 2006. So at a very young age, I was receiving sound biblical knowledge. The problem was that even though I knew all of the Sunday school answers and I knew how to act in front of people, I did not have a personal relationship with the Lord. Even at a young age, I did not feel at peace. I would keep myself awake at night, always wondering where, where I would go if I didn't wake up the next morning. On October 31st, 2011, Halloween night, my parents told me that I had to do my Patched Pirate devotions. The devotions for the day was to write out my testimony, and I did not know what that was, so I asked my parents. They explained to me that a testimony was basically your story of how you got saved. I realized that I was not saved, and that night my dad explained to me and helped me to understand that I was born a sinner and that there's nothing that I can do myself to stop from spending an eternity in hell. But I understand that Jesus came to earth to die on a cross and take the punishment for my sins, and that by trusting that Christ alone is my Savior, and he died for me and saved me from my sin, I would receive the free gift of eternal life with God. Fast forwarding a few years, I was in high school and struggling to stay on the straight and narrow path. I had stopped doing my devotions, I was not in the word, and I was just going through the motions at church. I was caught up with a bad group of friends, and at times I made bad decisions that I knew were not pleasing to God. My freshman year of college was very good because I grew a lot going to CSU, where I was in the Word daily, learning not just how to read the Bible, but actually take the verses and dissect them, and apply them to my life. Through prayer and a lot of thought, I transferred to a new college to pursue a career in law enforcement. This and the spiritual growth that I experienced got me closer on the path that I needed to be on, and I, but I was not there yet. I started dating my girlfriend Ashley, and I realized that I needed to be a spiritual leader for her, but I was still living in sin. I was relying on my own strength and abilities and not putting 100% faith in the Lord. Recently, I've been praying constantly to be used as God intended me to be used. One night, after a series of struggles, I found myself sitting on the floor at the edge of my bed in tears. I was just apologizing to God for falling away from him, and I just asked God for help. In that moment, I made the decision to rededicate my life to Christ and to strive to follow him completely. Since then, I have been in my devotions in the Word again, and I do not rely on my own skill set and strengths, but I instead lean on the Lord when struggles and challenges come my way. One of the verses that helps me is 2 Corinthians 4.8. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck, not, struck down, but not destroyed. What I take from this verse is that through whatever we face, with God's strength, we will not be crushed. Putting faith in God does not mean a trouble-free life, but it does mean that through everything we will never be alone. Mm -hmm. Amen. 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 So, and I just praise God for, uh, for your story, for the, the legacy of a godly mom and dad who have shepherded you through, through life, and just for this season in your life where Finally, it's all come, as I said earlier, full cycle, and you're truly owning your walk with Christ. And I just praise God for that evidence of grace in your life. And upon profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Last week you heard the story of Blake Ledick, and today we have the other half of the story with Jessica Ledick, and uh, she's going to come and share as well at this time. We're just thankful for what God has done in that family, so Jessica, go ahead and share. Good morning. I didn't grow up in a religious household. I grew up with a single mom, and there were four of us kids, so life was tough at times. I had heard of God and Jesus, but didn't really understand any of it, and didn't think I needed to care. Growing up, I had always felt this emptiness inside of me that I could never fill no matter how hard I tried. I was aimlessly drifting through life. When I was 19, I met my husband Blake, got married at 21, without truly understanding the importance of marriage and what it symbolized. I knew my husband had some religious background, but it wasn't something we talked about. We agreed, to do, we agreed to disagree and left it at that. Shortly after we got married, I got pregnant and had our son Lucas. And as much as I loved being a mother, that emptiness was still there. After about eight years of marriage, things were going from bad to worse, and I decided that I was just done. But around that same time, 
My husband started going back to church, and I started to see a change in him that I had never seen before. We both agreed to marriage counseling, and were referred here to Grace Baptist. We met with Pastor Jeff and started attending weekly Sunday service. We were welcomed with open arms. For the first time in my life, I was willing to learn of Jesus and the sacrifice he made for me. The more I learned, the more it made sense, and the more I wanted that salvation. In October 2017, I was saved. Not only did Jesus save my life, he saved my marriage. I am no longer empty. In the last three years, my family and I have been through the hardest times we've ever had to go through. We had multiple deaths in my family, including my mother, and I have watched my son get diagnosed and fight cancer. I've been able to get through these hard times with the support of my family, the amazing people here at Grace, and above all else, my faith. As difficult as life can get, I know the Lord is on my side, and in the end, it's all going to be okay. The verse I chose is Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and in the, in the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Well, Jessica, what a, what a neat thing to see your growth through the years since you've been coming here. And, and just the very real evidence of what Christ has done in your life. And I'm just excited about that and excited about what he has in store for you in the future. And so upon profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Next, we have Justine Vogt. What's exciting about getting to know Justine is just to see how God has used friendships that our people have had out in the community, make connections with people, and so she's going to share her story at this time. Hello. Um, I've always strived to do my best and be perfect in everything I've done. Make sure to do life in a certain way, a certain order, check all the boxes, and all is good. When I was younger, it was don't disappoint my parents, make the teachers like you, do all the sports, don't forget to fit in with the cool kids. Then it was the right college, new friends to impress, new parties, get the right job, work hard, play hard, it all costs, be perfect. And let me tell you, I got good at portraying that image, no matter what sin I needed to commit to get there. I would just put something good on top and nobody would know any better. Then it was get married, have kids, raise them perfectly too, check, check, check. Doesn't sound too awful, I mean, I was happy, I was successful, I, I, I. That was the problem. All I thought about was me and what other people thought of me. I had buried all my ick and wrongs under layers of misdiscretion, misdirection, a little too much fun here, just work a little harder over there to cover it up. The justifications for my choices. My kids weren't doing what I said or what I wanted them to do, so they needed to be yelled at. So-and-so made me angry, so that's why I did that. The I'm fines and the everything okay is okay is. This quest for this unattainable perfection to be liked just led me further down a path of sin and left me filled with anxiety and depression and just empty and feeling like a fake. I knew what the answer was. I knew that it was Jesus Christ that I was missing. I knew that because he had been putting it right there for me to see and follow. I just wasn't ready or I was too scared or still just thinking of myself so I would bolt. But he kept on trying. It was there years ago and a friend who first shared his truth with me. And then three to four years ago being invited to and attending the Christmas show here. A dad simply leaving his family's um, birthday party or his friends gathering in prayer. Being included in those prayers even though I felt so woefully unworthy of them. New friends with children who were the same ages of mine that were believers. New friendships here at Grace, all rooted in Christ. It was right there, I just needed to do it. Easier said than done, because it meant taking off all those layers of justifications for my choices, the misdirections, the perfectness and likability in my successes that I used to cover up my sins. What was left wasn't too great. 
I was left with the realization that it was simply my own selfishness and pride that led to each and every one of my choices. Not the justifications I told myself, or the anger, the hurt that I used as excuses of having to follow a certain path. Sorry, <laughs> to be told that God, to be told that through it all that God already knew all the, all the things I had done, that I wasn't hiding anything from him, and that he still called for me, still loved me, and that he even forgave me. I realized that I didn't need to cover up my sins or make up for them, I just needed to confess them. And I did all of it, the lies, the bad choices, the untruths. I realized that I didn't need to be perfect because I can never be. I just need to put Jesus at the center of my life and not my own wants and feelings. Once I did these things, the love and peace that he placed inside me with the Holy Spirit was a relief, relief and healing like no other. So now here I was, wonderfully saved. Now what? Luckily there was a guide for me, the Bible. I have been starting my mornings there and turning to those words to lead me. 1 Corinthians 13 verses 4 through 8 always just were some nice words that were read at a wedding to me. But to actually apply that to all of my relationships, especially my parenting, wow, that helps. It changes everything. I have tried to make a conscious effort to stop and think of Jesus in my decisions, not just myself. Try to make my heart a place for the Holy Spirit because he's there now, and no matter how many layers I try to put on, I can't hide. Ephesians 4, 30-32 says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every other form of malice. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as Christ God forgave you. I mean, can it get any clearer? The path is right there for me. I always thought I had to be in a certain place or state to pray and to talk to God. But to come to know that God will meet me where I am and that I can be a bit of a hot mess when I talk to him, this makes me seek him out even more. Don't get me wrong, I have faltered and stumbled, and I will again. I wanted to autocorrect right back to my old ways of justifications and anger because it's just so much easier than facing my own sins. But now that I had the Holy Spirit inside me, those ways didn't sit right. I have begun to notice things that God, he knows things. He puts things out there right when I need them. Like when I couldn't feel any lower for falling back into a sinful pattern or being filled with anger. Here comes a song lyric with just the right lyric to, to point me to just the right verse that I need to hear or a random text and a prayer from your pastor, even when my phone wants to autocorrect his last name to something else. It's Pastor Shirk. <laughs> to remind me that he forgives me anyway, and that I'm a work in progress, and that I'm still loved by God, and I'm still welcomed here. And for this reason, I'll leave you with this verse that I find that I often look to, Philippians 1.6. Be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs> Oh, Justine, what a, what a delight it is to just to get to know you, but most importantly, just in light of what you just shared, the, the truth of, of the active involvement of Christ and his life-changing work in your life, and we just are so thankful for that, and upon profession of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Finally, we have Wes Rissinger. Likewise, it's been great getting to know Wes. Known Wes for a few years now, and uh, God just done a really special work in his life. So go ahead and share, Wes. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, my name is Wes Rissinger. Um, like many here, I was born into a Christian household. Um, my parents, my sister, and I all attended church together. Um, I. Um, attended Sunday school, youth group, uh, church school, uh, Bible camp in the summer. Um, I grew up working in the nursery, uh, the sound room, um, at the age of 11 at uh, youth camp in the uh, middle of summer. I made a profession of faith in Jesus Christ and the sacrifice that he made um, for my sin and all sin um, in his death, burial, and resurrection. Um, however, since then, it has become or became uh, apparent to me that while I had made a profession of faith, um, I did not have and had not made um, the choice to receive genuine saving faith. Um, Pastor Shirk mentioned uh, people wearing uh, Bill's regalia coming to a church, and I'm an ardent Bill's fan, and from a very young age, I would sometimes see uh, church as an inconvenience on the way to the Bill's game. Um, 
It was something I had to go through in order to get to the afternoon of football and pizza and popcorn. Um, so onward through high school, I got great grades, um, captain of the soccer team, stage manager of the uh, drama club productions, continued into college, uh, dean's list, academic achievements, um, and then on into my career in law enforcement here in the city of Batavia, which is where I met Pastor Shirk. Um, and then through that time, uh, going through the police academy, um, doing well there, beginning my career, um, and learning how to uh, get through this job in this, uh, this troubled world. Um, the earlier this year and late last year, I was met with a variety of challenges um, that led me to actually seek out Pastor Shirk um, and speak with him. And we began meeting uh, for counseling on a weekly basis and um, talking about all sorts of things from anxiety to pride to anger. And um, it was in our third meeting that I realized uh, what I had alluded to already, that um, while I had made a profession of faith at the age of 11, I was not truly saved. And in our third meeting on July 14th of this year, um, I prayed and asked uh, Jesus Christ to be my personal savior. Um, and um, since then, um, fruit that I had not seen before has become apparent. Uh, the Bible that I had, um, that my parents had given me uh, was a nice thing to sit on the table. It was a nice thing to pick up every once in a while and, you know, read a few chapters and think, that's good. Well, now I can get through, um, I can go through five or six verses and actually meditate on them and get the meaning that previously I would not have um, been able to garner. Um, I still go through storms in no way, shape, or form of my completed work. Um, and I just think to uh, Proverbs 24, 16, uh, which says, the righteous man falls seven times and yet rises again. Uh, Pastor John Hagee um, continues on with that, um, where he says, uh, if you have fallen, get up, for God has conquered your storm. Um, I still go through storms, but Jesus is there for me. Um, and that's more than I could ever want and more than I could ever need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Wes, likewise, it's just been a true uh, blessing to get to know you and to, uh, to see the reality of uh, God's initiative of grace in your life, as we've talked about in light of that third meeting that we had. I, I hadn't gotten at all to probing or, or questioning you along the lines of our work together, but you were the one that came up with that of your need because Christ loved you too much to let you stay as you were. And I just praise God for that because that's what we're about. And I'm looking forward to seeing what God is going to continue to do as you learn and grow as a devoted follower of Christ. And so upon profession of your faith, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So we praise God for that. And uh, so it always comes down to this, you know, what about you? What about your story? Where are you in that journey? Your story, your journey is just as important as all of those that you've heard this morning. The worship team's gonna come and uh, just lead you in a time of reflection, singing a song that we wanna encourage you to reflect on those words, and then we'll be concluding our service.
Baptism is the front door into local church membership, and it's been the privilege of the deacons to hear those testimonies first, and uh, then to make a recommendation in light of what you have just heard. So, Paul Kessler, if you could just stand there and in your playground voice read nice and loud and clear, please. So that comes by way of a recommendation from the deacons. Is there a second to that? 
And Justin T. Jason TD makes that uh, motion. All those in favor say amen. amen. And we praise God for that, just like the testimonies you heard last Sunday as well. You've heard the word and know it's true. For now it rings inside of you. It's calling you to come away. Now will you come or stay? You want to. Now will you? You want to. Now will you? The truth that burns within you like a bed of fiery coals contains the power to liberate 10,000 captive souls. But if the truth will ever set you free, depends on you. You want to. Now will you? You want to, now will you? Those are the lyrics of a song that I memorized years ago and I've often quoted at the end of our times together in a baptism service because it really does put it where it belongs. It puts it in your court. And just like you heard in the variety of ways here this morning, there comes a point in time where you're either going to choose to own it or turn from it. And we want to help you in that journey. And uh, as we say off times here, there is always an open invitation. And uh, we would love the opportunity just to meet with you and to hear where you are, hear your questions, and to help you navigate them through God's answer book, the Bible. And uh, for you to come to a place of assurance and peace and meaning. That's why we exist. That's the hope of the gospel that only Jesus Christ can bring into your life. And we'd love to have you meet with us. And so we encourage you to get in touch with us at your earliest convenience. I'm going to close in uh, a word of prayer in a moment, but I just need to transition quickly in light of a couple of announcements here. And the first is a reminder for the men next Saturday, looking forward to our men's breakfast at 8 o'clock in the morning. There's a sign-up sheet out there. And then on the 8th, of December here, uh, the ladies' Christmas party, and likewise, there's a sign-up sheet for your involvement there, always a special time. And then also, uh, the uh, transition team has a brief announcement that they need to make. Uh, Ken Filling is one of those members of it, so Ken, you can come on up and make that happen. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Good. How are you kids doing? Really good or just good? Really good. Okay, good. Well, I don't know about you, but this has been an amazing hour. It's just so cool to see all the baptism and such. But as a pastor mentor, we're going to transition for a minute. Just talk a little bit about Pastor and Claudia's um, honoring. Um, maybe you've never really thought about this before, but just quickly, um, hang on. I'm going to get my phone because I don't have this verse memorized completely, but... You might be wondering um, why the transition team and why the church is honoring Pastor Shirk and Claudia in the first place. Have you ever wondered that? Why are we doing that? Well, that could be for a variety of reasons, but perhaps the most important is right here. Oh, I want you to know my screen locked. <laughs> Technology is a wonderful thing, but once you get to it, it's a beautiful thing. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 17 says this. Let the elders, who in our case would be the pastors, who rule well, be considered worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. Now, I don't know about you, but I think we hit the jackpot, proverbially speaking, in terms of finding three pastors that do all of those things, especially labor in preaching and teaching. And we're especially thankful for Pastor Shirk and Claudia, and because of that, we're going to be honoring them in a special way in the weeks to come. By now, you should have received or will receive very shortly a flyer that looks like this. How many of you have got something like that in the mail? That's awesome. Okay, that's a good start. This first sheet talks about the banquet that we're going to have for the Sharks. It's going to be Saturday, January 7th, 5 p.m. at Bontrager's. And there's all kinds of other information in here that you really want to check out. And if you can make it, and we'd love to have you join us, there's a QR code at the bottom that you can scan with your phone if you're tech savvy. If you're not so much, then we have a paper copy of a form that you can fill out at two tables in the foyer back there, one at each exit, basically. And there'll be somebody from the transition team, like me, uh, ready to take your money, basically. 
So hopefully you can make that. There are, however, other ways that you can join us in honoring Pastor and Claudia. In that same mailing, you should have received a sheet that looks something like this. Honoring Pastor and Claudia Shirk, how can you help? How many of you got this one? Okay, good. Uh, there's three ways that you can help us honor Pastor and Claudia. The first is through a photo book message that we're going to be doing. If you want to include a short message to them in that, you need to get that to Kayla, who just stepped out for a minute, sitting next to the very handsome column, by December 4th, which is only about a week away, right? I think the 4th is next Sunday. Uh, there's also an opportunity for those of you who'd like to put together a short video to do that. And the deadline for that is January 1st. And last but not least, if you're super creative and you're into creating decorations for, say, a table that could be used at the honor banquet, you can let Caitlin Rigdon know that by January 6th. Caitlin, are you in the, there you are. Could you just stand up for a minute, not to embarrass you, but not all of you might not know everybody in the transition team. There's Caitlin. She's who you need to see for that. Um, there are going to be folks from the transition team here in the front of the sanctuary and out in the foyer to answer any questions you might have. But Lord willing, you can participate in one or maybe even all of those in the days and weeks to come. Thanks, Ken. Stand, please, and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Father, I'm just so grateful for uh, the privilege to be about the best thing, and that being the rescue of lives, for people to experience the fact that Jesus and Jesus alone holds the keys to their darkness, to their despair, to their heartache, to their restlessness. And Father, we just praise you for the fact that you still are at work here and we celebrate that, we rejoice at that, and we're so thankful for being able to be a part of what you are doing. And we just pray for your ongoing work in our midst, that in the days to come, we might hear even testimonies of transform transformation that Christ alone brings because of an encounter of your truth that people experience even here today. And so we just commit this moving of your spirit to you. And again, we just pause to say thank you, and we just praise you for the wonderful hour that we've enjoyed of seeing you at work. So we glorify you, we magnify your name. We pray that you dismiss us with your blessing and your ongoing work, for it's in Christ's great name. Amen. You're dismissed.